Hello everyone. Uh, my presentation today will be on Paparazzi UAV system and in particular the way we are using it for uh, research applications. As an introduction, let's see what kind of UAV system are already uh, available. So you probably already know a few of them and in particular PixSoc and RGPilot. Those two are probably the, the most well-known uh, UAV open source UAV system on the market. They both date back around 2007-8 and uh, they actually uh, share a lot of uh, in common and especially the Mavlink communication library. They even both uh, started the uh, drone code initiative as uh, part of the Linux Foundation in 2014 but uh, RGPilot left two years later, mostly due uh, to license issues. Another uh, well-known autopilot was uh, Open, uh, Open Pilot, but uh, finally in 2014, they had to fork into Libre Pilot, uh, and uh, if I understood correctly, uh, due to legal issues as well. The Multiway initiative is a very, very interesting uh, hacking project uh, started uh, in 2011 and that uh, finally became base flights uh, which is uh, finished today but uh, that was forked into clean flight forked into beta flight into inav and actually so many other that it's a little bit confusing <coughs> uh, here but uh, for sure uh, this project are very, very good uh, for FPV flights and uh, beta flights is one of the, the best out there. So where are we with uh, Paparazzi? Uh, Paparazzi has been started in 2003. It's probably the uh, oldest autopilot open source uh, still alive on the market here. And even if we have probably the smallest community, we are uh, still <laughs> using it for uh, many applications around the world. So what is exactly Paparazzi? So as I say, it's an open source project, but for both software and hardware, and aiming at providing a solution for low-cost micro and mini UAV systems. It all started in 2003 by uh, two researchers from INAC, Antoine Drouin and Pascal Brisset, and uh, it's officially supported by INAC since 2005. Today, the main contributors of the project are the uh, UAV research program of INAC, uh, to which I belong, and the MAV lab from TU Delft in the Netherlands. But uh, some of our universities, companies, and individual people are contributing to it. Uh, finally, the uh, license uh, <coughs> we use mostly is the uh, GPL version 2. So why do we do drones at INAC? And by the way, what is INAC? So it, INAC is the French Civil Aviation University. It's a quiet old uh, school <coughs> located in Toulouse in, at the south of France. And we are providing a wide range of uh, education programs ranging from bachelor to master of science, advanced masters, PhDs, but the main particularity of this school is to actually being a professional training school for air traffic controllers, technicians and engineers for civil aviation authorities and pilots as well. So why do we do drones there? Uh, the first thing is because uh, we do research on UAV uh, and not only the system, but also the control, the design, optimization, applications, and so on. Uh, then drones are a wonderful tool for education and we need that for future engineers, but also for air traffic controllers because at some point they will have to deal with the drones in the air traffic control. Uh, we are experts as well for the French uh, Civil Aviation Authorities for many aspects in regarding the integration of UAVs in the air traffic. And finally, one of the uh, initial goals of this research program was to promote the use 
of civil applications using UAVs and uh, in particular the use of UAVs in research fields, not only uh, research on UAVs but research using UAVs. So let's have a look at what's inside and what is a UAV uh, architecture. So the first thing is that it's not because it's an unmanned aerial vehicle systems that we don't have pilots. UAV do have pilots. They are just not on board and they are working in a different way. I mean, different from what a pilot would do and different from, from what uh, air traffic control would do. So at the very basic level, you have the uh, airborne segment with the UAV and on the ground, uh, you have uh, several tools that we have decided to split in the case of paparazzi. So one is dealing with the communication system and the modems. One, for instance, is uh, in charge of the uh, HMI, the uh, Human Machine Interface here, the, and that's what we call the ground control station in general. <laughs> and you can see that all those elements are all connected together uh, using a bus here which is called IV and the nice thing with that is that it's uh, really extensible you can uh, connect many uh, elements to it uh, depending on your application you can add new tools to your system very easily and because the operator is not inside the UAV it means that you are able to control many UAVs from a single ground station and the thing is that you can also control one UAV from many ground stations, but in this case, uh, you you have the the possibility to have several aircrafts with air-to-ground communications, but also air-to-air -air communications, and uh, we are supporting at the moment fixed-wing uh, platforms, rotorcrafts, multicopters, hybrid, so transitioning vehicles, and uh, a few rovers. So let's see what's actually inside the UAV or more specifically what is inside the flight controller. It's actually quite straightforward. The idea is that you have a bunch of sensors that could be GPS, inertial measurement units, barometers and so on. And you want them to send data to the estimation filters. That could be a Kalman filter, for instance, and that will produce position, velocity, um, <clears throat> whatever you need to do your control, that is from navigation, guidance, and stabilization. Once you have produced the orders here, you have to send that to the actuators so you are able to move the control surfaces or to change the rotation speeds of the motor. In order to make all that easy, you just add some components around. So for instance, here we have uh, internal middleware with uh, publish and subscribe capabilities so that the sensor are just sending data which are used, consumed by the estimation filters. And the results they produce are pushed to a state interface working as a blackboard that can be used by any elements from the system then. You also require some communication tools uh, like data link and telemetry or data logging. And mm, what is also very important is the, uh, uh, the, the task handling. So you, you, you need something like a task dispatcher in order to tell uh, who is going to, to do what. And it's also dealing with the modes. Uh, I will come back to that later, but you have to decide uh, which part of the control is being actually called, depending on what you are going to do. And flying for flying is nice, but that's the, not the, uh, uh, the only thing you want to do. You actually fly to do something. <coughs> and it means that you want to have control over your payload that could be moving the uh, servos, that could be uh, doing image processing, that could be uh, getting data from uh, onboard sensors for various kinds of applications. And if you can do that from the flight controller itself, then you can keep everything uh, very small. 
the final step is that uh, you would like eventually uh, to make this as configurable as possible. So it means that you will use probably configuration file and that would be a XML file for us uh, to configure all of this and uh, let it do as you like. So why would uh, Paparazzi uh, is interesting for us uh, to do uh, research? <clears throat> the, the key idea in Paparazzi is that we, we want to integrate as many functions as possible inside the embedded software. It means that we, we don't see the autopilot as a black box. Uh, we want to be able to add new features at different levels so you can customize your autopilot. And to do that, it means that your system needs to be modular, extensible and versatile. So each of the box that you have seen before can be replaced by something else. Uh, they can be extended. You can add new ones <coughs> that doesn't exist yet, or you can add new elements on the ground. And by versatile, I mean that you would like to, uh, to adapt the way you control the system depending on your application. And this is uh, where I'm going now. So let's ask to the pilot, uh, oh, we would like to control this drone. And there is many, many ways to control a drone that could be through a complex flight plan, that could be using just uh, waypoints or positions, uh, velocity, attitude, rates, or whatever. So here are the most common ways to control uh, UAVs, and that's the, the one uh, we have also in Paparazzi. At, at the very basic level, you have the radio control, <coughs> which is either the direct control of the actuators or eventually the basic stabilization of your system. And that's uh, mostly used by uh, safety pilots, for instance. Then uh, you have the possibility to have what we call guided mode. It's very similar to the uh, uh, Pixox system. And it means that you are just skipping all the complex navigation to uh, part and you just control the position or velocity of your aircraft and that's make it very easy to control from the ground. The, the next one here, the mission mode, is actually what you probably do if you use anything else besides paparazzi. It means that you are just sending single task every time you need so that could be uh, going to the waypoint, going to uh, do a circle, or uh, doing an action at a given uh, position, and so on. Uh, and what is very uh, specific and novel into Paparazzi is the capability of using complex flight plans. And by flight plans, I mean a full programming language to uh, describe uh, many complex uh, features. And that's what I'm presenting now. So the basic principle is that you write a program to an XML file, but uh, a, a fly plane basically is only a list of waypoints and blocks. So those waypoints, they have a fixed number, but you can reuse them for many different things. You can use them also to define polygons, safety areas, for instance, uh, like protection stuff. Uh, and the blocks, uh, it's a group of basic instructions. And instructions could be flight instructions, like go to a point, follow a line, uh, do a circle, oval, like basic flight patterns that uh, we all know. Uh, but not only, you can also uh, use different kind of uh, control statement like for and while loops, exceptions, that would be the same of using conditions, uh, a deroute, which is the equivalent of a go to. And finally, you can call any functions or change any variables from your uh, embedded code. It means that you can do actually anything you like, anything you can program. So what is being done with that? Uh, 
we are generating the codes. So it's actually a, a C code, a flight plan header that is then integrated to the autopilot at compile time and which is then flight on board. And what can you do as a user? Uh, you can just send, uh, inform send messages to move a waypoint, change the current block, or change a settings, any kind of settings. And, and that's it. I mean, with these three types of commands, you can control anything in your flight plan and uh, make it very, very flexi flexible. But OK, we are compiling everything. <coughs> so how does it look? Uh, in practice, the more you program beforehand, the less you have to control during the flights. Uh, with a basic example here, it's a block that I call spiral. You can see you have two types of exceptions. Uh, one is looking at the, uh, the, the time without uh, receiving a new data link message. So if it's greater than uh, 10 seconds, then uh, we should go to a block called standby. Uh, if the power voltage goes lower than uh, 10 volts, then we should probably land. And for the rest, we do a loop. So we do a three time a circle around the waypoint uh, called ohm, uh, for which the altitude will depend of the uh, index of the loop. And the radius will change from uh, a basic uh, value uh, that you can change eventually from the ground. And uh, it's also a function of the time spent during the wall block. And that will actually make the spiral uh, shape and you do the circle uh, for 60 seconds. And when it's done, you just go back to the uh, standby, standby block at the end. So this little bit of XML code is used to generate this C code, much longer, of course. And if you compare that to what would do a human operator, uh, you would have to monitor four different variables that would be the data link time, the power voltage, uh, the stage time, <coughs> uh, the current uh, altitude, and actually the radius. Uh, you would have to change this uh, radius. You would have to uh, uh, switch to the correct block depending on, on the event, if it is a power issue, if it is a time issue, or if it is just finish. So that, that's a lot of jobs, a lot of work that is just programmed right there and uh, working automatic automatically. So does that mean that we have to know beforehand everything that we are going to do? Uh, of course not. We might be able to, uh, we might want to, to change our mind during the flight and do something which is not in the flight plan. So this is possible if you mix the flight plan with the mission control. So the mission control is just sending messages containing basic patterns like uh, go to a point, uh, fly around the circle, follow a line, or actually any kind of uh, flight patterns or actions that you would have registered before flying. And all this uh, basic elements are just stored inside uh, dynamic queue, which is then called inside the flight plan. Why? Uh, because the flight plan is still very good at defining safety areas, at controlling very complex phases like um, takeoff and landing. And um, then once you are waiting in the air, you just let the flight plan uh, give the control to the mission system and it will perform all this uh, list of actions that you can uh, modify during the flights from uh, ground messages. Okay, we have already two different ways to use modes, but in the end, how many modes do we have? And that can become really tricky because uh, <coughs> if you ask the pilots, the pilot, he, he may have uh, very different ideas. He, he could change his mind every time. And if we look at what we had to know, 
So for the fixed wing, we have the manual mode, which is just uh, controlling the plane directly through the actuators. We have assisted mode, which is, uh, let's say, using the uh, stabilization control only, and the navigation, which is performing the flight plan, and then two extra safety modes. Um, but for the rotorcraft and the hybrids, we have many, many mix of horizontal and vertical modes and we just ended up with 20 mods, which is way too much. We had to do something for that. So also those legacy codes are very nice because you don't need to configure anything to use that. Uh, we also have the possibility to generate the autopilot that you actually need. So let's uh, look at this very uh, basic and simple example. Uh, it's an autopilot with two modes, <coughs> two normal modes, uh, the, the manual and the uh, uh, navigation mode. We have this home mode when uh, we are too far or when we lose uh, some capabilities. Uh, there is a face safe mode in case everything goes wrong. And once you have described this, you put that into an XML file and you also need to describe what's inside each uh, of this mode, so you have to tell what would be the uh, actual uh, control stack uh, that uh, you want to call uh, in each mode, and the, the result is uh, generated code, again, uh, integrated to the autopilot and compiled on board. Okay, now we have a nice flexible software but we have to put that somewhere because uh, it's about UAVs and uh, at some point you want to fly. So it means that you have to go to a flight controller. And uh, as many projects Paparazzi has designed over the time uh, for his community, a lot of hardware boards. And this is an example of the uh, latest autopilot that we have designed at ENAC. Uh, this is called the Tawaki, it's based on the STM32F7 uh, microcontroller. But basically any uh, controller board that is using the STM32F1, F4 or F7 could be used potentially with Paparazzi. And we are also able to use the Parrot drones like Air Drones, Bibop and uh, Disco uh, plane. And uh, ENAC is also taking part of uh, several research uh, activities where we have to design our own hardware. And here, this is an example of a high resolution meteorological sensor uh, capable of measuring uh, temperature, humidity and pressure, for instance. Uh, but uh, also something a bit more complex with uh, a five hole probe. So something capable of measuring the 3D wind and turbulence and you can see that it's integrating uh, directly sensors, uh, microcontroller units for uh, pre-processing, SD card and so on. And everything is integrated because, again, we want to keep it very uh, small and compact. OK, so let's go for uh, some uh, research and application uh, that we are doing with all of this. <coughs> Uh, as an introduction, I would like to show you uh, this video. So, uh, one of the key ideas of our uh, recent research is to get the best from both planes and rotorcrafts. And uh, the idea is that we want to make U small UAVs capable of flying, of taking off and landing vertically and transitioning to forward flights for energy efficient mission. So the actual difficulty here is that we, we are looking for the equilibrium transition. It means that at any time of the transition between over and forward flights, we want to be able to stop eventually and go back to the initial position. So it's not just a matter of uh, putting full throttle and doing the transition. It's also able to do uh, like everything that uh, a normal plane would do, except that you can see that there is no vertical tail. So everything is controlled by software and by differential thrust. And 
the, the end goal is to be able to make the transition as smooth as possible, as you can see. Okay, so how do we get there? Well, first, let's go back a little bit to the past. What we used to do is to have ideas and putting that into a final design unique for every plane. And then going to the uh, manufacturing process. And I mean by that, uh, building molds, uh, assembling everything uh, with carbon or uh, glass fiber, with uh, resin, epoxy resin. So a very long process to go to the maiden flight within one full year for a large aircraft. Now, using a bit more different approach. So the, the main process is the same, but uh, we think as modular design. So every part of the aircraft can be disassembled easily. And uh, several parts can be actually reused. <clears throat> and because of the uh, 3D printing capabilities that are now available, we can just print every part of the, the, the aircraft overnight and the, the human action is only limited to the final assembly, soldering and so on. So the actual process is now reduced to one month. Of course, you have a cost because the uh, overall efficiency of an aircraft built in one month is not exactly the same than the one uh, that you can see here. Uh, with this uh, uh, nice looking uh, uh, finishing. So is it an issue? Not really, not that much because we are uh, mostly dealing with uh, some key parts, key improvements that we want to be able to test as fast as possible. Okay, but we now have another kind of problem because the classic control theories are mostly based on models. And uh, in the case of a fixed wing aircraft, it means that uh, we would like to have a very accurate aerodynamic model that you can obtain through a very time consuming and expensive uh, wind tunnel campaign. Or you could also do uh, computer fluid dynamics modeling uh, so old software, but still very time consuming. But actually, do we really need a model? So this next example is uh, the, an example of the application of a control technique called model-free control. And you can see that this aircraft is uh, being flying in front of the open jet generator inside the uh, flight area of uh, INAC. And it's only attitude control, no positioning. It's done by the pilot. But still, in many different attitudes, the aircraft is uh, flying pretty well. It's controlling correctly. And the, um, this model free control is based on the estimation of uh, what we call the ultra model. So it means that all the unknown dynamics is estimated online. And you only need to provide a little bit of information about the, uh, um, uh, about the influence of the control over the uh, outputs, but not that many details. And this is where I want to uh, stress that there is always a model item somewhere. You still have to give some information about some knowledge about your system. It's just that the uh, efforts that you have to put uh, to get uh, something that is working is uh, different and eventually very limited to what we had before. So, okay, here is in the other example of uh, technique, which is not very far from the MFC, which is called INDI uh, for incremental nonlinear dynamic inversion. So uh, this is a work that has been done initially by the uh, TU Delft team and implemented for uh, paparazzi by them. So the idea is that you want here to only limit the model to the actuator efficiencies and dynamics. 
and that's it. No aerodynamic model there. And you can compare the effects of INDI with uh, classical PID control. So the, uh, the quadcopter, the bob here, is going in and out a wind tunnel. And with INDI, which is based on the control of acceleration, the position tracking is much, much more accurate and the wind disturbance are completely rejected and extremely fast uh, compared to the uh, classical linear RTI uh, theory uh, using PIDs. <clears throat> okay, so that's really impressive. And what if we mix this approach with another approach, which is formation control. Okay, so here the idea is that if we have a single UAV, we can do many things, but not everything. And maybe if you use several ones, you can do even better. So in this case, we uh, put uh, virtual forces between each UAVs and by just uh, adjusting the uh, uh, equilibrium between each forces, you can move all these uh, UAVs together in translation, rotation, and eventually both at the same time here. And the, the position control is completely done using the INDI. So it means that if you attach all of them together with ropes and a large payload in the center, well, the, the, the loads and the, the ropes are seen the same way than the uh, actual guest right before. So it just flies without even modeling, without noticing that there is something attached to them. And th this is one of the uh, powerful advantage of uh, using this kind of uh, control. Okay, so, so far all the uh, quadcopters that you have seen have four rotors. And if you happen to lose one, then you are in trouble. So what about uh, trying to make it a little bit more robust by adding some extra propellers? So if you have an hexacopter, maybe you can afford to lose one propeller and your aircraft will continue to fly. So here you have two different shapes and you can see that we have built the two of them and make them exactly at the same weight. And you may think that they are uh, behaving the same way if you lose any of one of their motors. But actually the theory and the math says that for the star shape here, it will crash if you lose any of the motors except number two. But for the Y shape, it will just keep flying whatever motors you lose. And here you can see on this video, so here it's lo losing propeller one, two, three, four, that the star shape is actually starting to spin and crashing, uh, except in the case of uh, propeller two fading. But the Y shape is keep just working in any condition. So you would say, okay, why not using all the time this Y shape? Because if you have these two propellers on top of each other, it greatly reduces the efficiency. And finally, the fly time of the uh, Y shape is only 60% of the star shape. So in the end, you have to make the uh, compromise between robustness and power efficiency or you have to find the right way to uh, have something in between and get the, both of them. Let's switch to uh, uh, another kind of issue and that's what I call the HMI headache. Uh, if we ask the pilot uh, what he would like to see on his HMI, he will probably tell you that he wants something uh, very simple and with only the most useful information. So mm, probably something like that. And uh, we, we had a lot of trials and also errors in Paparazzi in the past. Here is an example of the very, very first HMI of Paparazzi. 
it's a bit crude. And uh, after that, we have tried many things like cell phones, smartphones, papers, web applications. And oh, this one is very interesting. It's uh, using a very novel uh, interact in uh, interactive programming language from the HMI lab of ENAC. Uh, but the performances were not good enough at that time to make it usable in real-life applications. So we switched to um, Glasses, Game Boy, and finally the 15 years old GCS is at this time still the best to use. It has everything, it's very easy to, uh, to use it as all features and everything. But still, we are working to replace it at some point. And finally, sometimes we have the opportunity to do some very interesting things regarding HMIs. So this is an example of uh, a project with uh, people with uh, limited capabilities in cognitive and motor capabilities. And you can see that if we, if you build them adapted control pads, eventually using uh, modeling clay switches in this case, they are able to control something as complex as a UAV. And it's actually not for fun. It's uh, really uh, something which is monitored and supervised by uh, medical staff. And we build them a dedicated HMI so they can choose the exercise. And this is uh, one of their way to actually monitor their improvements, their skills to perform complex uh, tasks. My, my last projects will be some all much higher. And if you are wondering uh, all the clues looks like. A nice thing with you, Evie, is, is that you can actually go there and check by yourself. So the cloud exploration is, or actually atmosphere exploration, is not something new in paparazzi. It has been used since 2008 by the University of Bergen in Norway, and since 2012 by Meteor France with the help of uh, INAC. And the thing is that the meteorologists like in situ data around the clouds. This is something that you cannot do using uh, sounding or using uh, uh, satellites, images, or using even a main aircraft. Uh, they, they want to be able to go through the frontier between the clouds and the uh, our surrounding atmosphere to understand the microphysical properties at uh, this region. And <clears throat> Let's assume that you want to go to this kind of clouds, cumulus type. And if you want to know what's at the border, uh, you design some adaptive flight patterns that will uh, use onboard sensors to decide whether or not they are entering or exiting the clouds and turn around to detect the, the frontier. So this cloud sensor is something that you have to embed and you get this kind of result. So you are able online to decide whether or not you are inside or outside. If you apply these patterns to an actual uh, cloud, it's not something that easy actually. You need uh, tight cooperation between several people. Of course, you need a UAV operator that will control the aircraft using the flight plan that we have seen before. But you also need some experts in uh, atmospheric science to uh, decide of the mission part. And this is where you have the mix between mission and flight plans. And uh, it's also in this case helped by a real-time cartography uh, made of the clouds from the real-time data sent back to the ground. Actually, you also need some flight director because you're flying in uh, airspace, so you have to coordinate with the uh, air traffic controllers around. And this is how it looks. And because the clouds are just moving with the winds, that's the kind of trajectory that you will see if you do that. 
but if you uh, put that together to get uh, the trajectory in the same uh, local frame of the clouds, you can see that the aircraft is actually flying around the clouds that uh, is probably here around the, uh, the pink part of the trajectory. So th this example is coming from the uh, a flight campaign that we did uh, early this year in January 2020. Uh, this is a three weeks campaign at the Barbados Island and we had several uh, single and uh, multi UAV flights. You can see here there is an aircraft and this is the uh, real-time sensor and detecting the clouds that you can monitor with the uh, onboard camera and each time is going in and out uh, you can see it on the real-time sensor and you can see that the aircraft is actually adapting its trajectory to uh, follow the, the border of the clouds of course this kind of uh, experiment is uh, something very interesting, but uh, it's also something that goes with the real world issues. And uh, uh, we had many like goats, trees, uh, we have to deal with customs, but in the end we have lost only one plane, uh, lost, broken only one plane, and uh, this is actually a, a pretty good score. Okay, so what are the uh, future challenges for uh, UAVs now? Th this video is coming from the uh, U-Space uh, initiative from the uh, European Committee. And these people, they are selling drones almost everywhere in unsegregated areas, uh, flying in uh, urban areas, doing automatic deconflictions with many other UAVs or uh, manned aircraft or helicopters and they are carrying in this case medical stuff but okay that could be something else so that's interesting but actually what's behind what's behind all that uh, here the, the the issue is that you have to find the right balance between safety first because it's aviation so we need to have something uh, with a certain level of safety and uh, the certification process for manned aviation is very very different from the one that we have we can do for UAVs because uh, they are so different by nature by size by risk uh, so we, we have to invent a new certification process for them you also need to deal with uh, regulation and you have the UTM initiative from NASA in the US you have the U space in Europe and if you consider uh, air traffic controllers, they are controlling maybe hundreds of aircrafts every hours. And if it goes as expected with drones, they will have to handle thousands of uh, flying objects. And it means that they have to change the way they work and they have to uh, use uh, more AI, whatever it means. Um, you also have to support that uh, with some market expansions because, well, I guess some business has to make money, I guess, somehow. But not only. We have to look at the social benefits of using drones and especially using drones everywhere. The, is it something that can bring medical assistance to people? Is it uh, an activity which is uh, sustainable for the health? Uh, I don't know, is it something that can bring better educations to children? I don't know. But this is something that we have to take care about, as well as the social acceptance. Do people accept to have that many aircrafts flying above their heads every time? But okay, what's about the small open source projects like Paparazzi and others? Uh, I guess uh, some of them will continue to focus on leisure and commercial solutions and uh, by that I mean um, Pixok is doing great, uh, Arduipilot as well and uh, Betaflight is uh, really a good uh, solution for FPV uh, racing. But as a university, we, we need to, to keep working on that because we need to understand and explain what is inside to 
uh, our future engineers or to uh, the future air traffic controllers, to the, uh, civil aviation authorities, we have to, to know and to understand that. And also we want to continue providing affordable and customized solutions for different kinds of people and especially researchers that may not be able to use for different reasons uh, commercial products. And uh, for that, the uh, compliance with the regulation uh, can be a challenge. It is already a challenge, actually, because it's moving a lot. And uh, for sure, it's, uh, it's, it's really something that uh, we have to take care of. Uh, but finally, what keeps us in, in this area is uh, that we want to explore new research ideas and, and to implement that in a flexible uh, UAV system like Paparazzi. And as a conclusion, I would say that open source projects live with their community and uh, it means that you are all welcome to join in. Thank you very much uh, and uh, please uh, come and uh, visit the uh, website paparazziuav.org. Goodbye. <laughs>